Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. I'm so glad to be able to join you today for this period of Bible study. Now, as a Christian, we have been redeemed. We've been redeemed from our past life of sin to walk a new life. We've been raised from spiritual death to spiritual life, been added to the church. Paul points out in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1 that, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. Here Paul said that we have been called with a high calling from God. It's the highest calling that any of us will ever receive. And this calling is not just a hobby or a, a trivial addition to an already busy life, but it's a priority that should be the most important thing in our life. To walk worthy is to exhibit the kind of life that would give honor to Christianity. We are to give glory and honor to God, and we do that by our life. Paul says something very similar in Philippians 1 and verse 27, when he said, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. He said one thing is most important, and that is that our conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. How do we live? Do we give glory to God or do we bring shame upon him? You see, as a Christian, we're going to be doing one or the other. Because people look at our lives, they look at who we are. And they know that we are Christians and therefore, what kind of impression are we giving to other people? So what are some qualities of this worthy walk? Well, that's what we find in chapter 4 and verse 2 of the Ephesians. There Paul starts out by saying, with all lowliness and gentleness. The word lowliness is the word humility. Now, in the first century, humility was not considered to be a worthy quality. It was often used to refer to someone who was weak and cowardly. Well, obviously, that's not too complimentary to a person. If we say he is weak and coward, uh, that's not being complimentary, is it? And yet here Paul said that we are to be humble. You see, biblical humility is not being weak. It's not being a doormat for someone else. It's not thinking low yourself or how worthless you are or how that you're so unable to do anything. That's not it at all. Humility means being aware of who you are. You're recognizing your strengths and you're recognizing your weaknesses. You know, we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. Humility means you lay your life before God. You accept without reservation God's direction for your life. It means you're seeking God's direction, not your own. Closely related to humility is the second characteristic, which is gentleness or meekness. This attitude results from humility. And likewise, this word is oftentimes misunderstood and misapplied and maybe misdefined even. For instance, Webster defines meekness as too submissive easily imposed upon. Well, obviously, from our standpoint, that is not very complimentary either, is it? It's not complimentary to always be willing to do just whatever somebody else wants you to do. That's, so, that's weakness. That is being too submissive. And that's not what meekness is all about. You see, biblical meekness is not a lack of conviction that submits to everyone who comes along trying to impose his will upon you. It basically means strength under control. You see, rather than thinking that a, a meek person is weak or someone who has no power or no control, it really means the exact opposite of that. It takes a person with great strength to be humble and to be meek. For example, if you break a wild horse, 
that horse becomes under your control. Now, we all know that a horse is much stronger than any human being. When a wild horse is wild, then obviously that strength is under the control of the horse and not under control of anyone else. But once you break that horse, all his strength and power is still there. But now he's under the control of the rider. Now that horse's power is subject to control of someone else. So unity demands strength and meekness demands strength. We look at a couple examples in the Bible to help us understand what meekness is all about. For instance, in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3, it is stated that Moses was very meek. He was more meek than anyone else on the earth. Now, Moses certainly was not weak. It takes great strength and courage for Moses to go and face the Pharaoh of Egypt and demand that he let the slaves go. But he did that. So Moses was certainly not weak. He was certainly not cowardly. But he was under the control of someone else. And that someone else was God. You see, Moses willingly responded to the commands of God. In that respect, then, he was very meek. Jesus is stated in Matthew 11, verse 29, that he is meek and lowly in heart. Well, Jesus certainly was not weak either because twice we read that he cleansed the temple. He was willing to stand up to the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders, especially in Matthew chapter 23. Yes, he certainly was not weak, and yet he was very meek and lowly in heart. He was under the control of God. The idea of gentleness or meekness also includes being sensitive to the feelings of others. You are sensitive to what other people may need and want. You're not always seeking your own way. You're sensitive to what others need and want. And then the third characteristic mentioned here is that of patience or long-suffering. This word has to do with our relationship with other people. And the word literally means to be long-tempered. It means you bear insult, unfair treatment, criticism, hatred, jealousy, and so forth when that is the price for doing what is right. In other words, you're willing to bear up under even false accusations and unfair treatment in order to continue to do what is right. It means you accept the negative circumstances and the people who cause those negative circumstances without bitterness, without irritation, and without complaint. You're willing to work a long time to resolve a problem with another person. Now, to many, that sounds unreasonable. And that sounds like something that we certainly cannot do. How, how do you expect me to bear up under false treatment and so forth? Well, that's the only thing that separates us from the people of the world. You see, if we get angry and want to strike back with vengeance against those who mistreat us, then we're just like everyone else. Everyone else in the world wants to do that. God wants us to be different. We are supposed to be different because we are God's children. And we are to walk worthy of the calling which we have. And part of that worthy walk is being patient and long-suffering. That's exactly what Christ did. Christ suffered many false accusations and unfair treatment. And yet he was willing to even forgive even when he was on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The next characteristic is that of forbearance in love. Forbearance means that you're blind, or rather does not mean that you're blind to someone else's faults and shortcomings. It is not just gritting your teeth and putting up a person, but it means to be slow to take offense at others. It means bearing with the shortcomings, the failings, and even the faults of others. You see, it means that since we also recognize that we are not perfect, then we recognize others are not perfect either. And since we are not perfect, we stop trying to seek perfection and expect perfection in others. 
Now, the only thing that makes this possible, of course, is love. And that's why Paul says, forbearance in love. In love, we seek another person's best welfare. It means we're going to be willing to forgive when forgiveness is needed. It means we also strengthen their weaknesses. Now, it doesn't mean we overlook every fault that they have, but it does mean that we, over, we bear with their weaknesses and their faults. You see, it seems that some brethren are always ready to accuse and debate with anyone who differs with them. Well, we should not be that way, because if we be that way, then we're going to just consume one another. In Galatians 5 and verse 15, for instance, Paul gives a warning. He said, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. The words be consumed by one another literally means to eat one another up. Now, what Paul is saying here, be very careful. When you're always biting one another and fighting and, and vengeance and so forth, then you need to be aware because you're going to eat one another up. Well, certainly that's not what we as Christians should do. We should desire unity. In chapter 4 and verse 3 of Ephesians, Paul says to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Rather than always fighting with one another, we are to be united in peace. Now, this is not simply wishing there were unity. The word endeavor implies that we should intensely labor for unity. In other words, you really work at it. You make every effort to have unity with others. Now, in order for us to achieve unity in the body of Christ, this is something each member must strive to do. Leaders cannot do it by themselves. You the leaders might be united among themselves, but unless every member seeks to be united, then unity will never be achieved. We must desire unity. We must work for unity. But then we also must be fruitful. Part of the worthy walk is that we're willing to bear fruit for God. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10. There Paul said that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Again, Paul emphasizes the fact that we should walk worthy of the Lord. Part of walking worthy of the Lord is pleasing him, doing whatever he wants us. But then also he said that we should be fruitful in every good work. You see, if we're walking worthy of the Lord, then our lives must be different from everyone else in the world. And I think if we really understood that as Christians, our lives are to exemplify the profession that we make of God, then our lives would be different. Many times I think people forget or they overlook the fact that we are representatives of God. We are part of God's family, and part of God's family means people are always looking at us and expecting us to live differently. We need to walk worthy of the Lord and be fruitful. You see, our lives and our religion must agree. Since God hates sin, then we must hate sin as well. And we must being fruitful rather than loving sin a worthy walk involves being fruitful and increasing in the knowledge of God I hope this lesson would be beneficial to you to help us help you realize the kind of walk that we need to live the kind of life we need to live as children of God that we walk worthy of the calling with the characteristics that we've mentioned today and the fact that we should be fruitful, bringing much fruit to the glory and honor of God. I hope this would encourage you to live your life more like the kind of life that God wants you to live as his child. Thank you for your attention today. Be blessed by studying the word of God. To receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine, 
and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course. Kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, PO Box 15, Arsradi Madurai, 625016, Tamil Nadu. For more details, dial 9244204420. 9244214421 God bless you The Church of Christ salutes you